We're bringing together some of the brightest minds in finance and economics to answer questions about the new normal of work. Everything from which jobs are going extinct to what the future workplace will even look like in a post-pandemic world. Today, we're talking to Mohammed El Arian. He's the chief economic advisor at Allianz and the former CEO of PIMCO. What does the workplace look like once the workforce is fully vaccinated? It's going to look different in the sense there will be much more hybrid work. There'll be people working in offices. There'll be people working at home. It's going to be a much more fluid population than it was before. And it's going to evolve. I think a lot of people are going to discover that hybrid workplaces are not that easy to run. And we're going to have lots of changes in the way work is done. On the willingness side, some people will want to have more of a hybrid role, if not working at home. And then companies are also realizing that they can cut on certain costs. So I think these two issues are going to come together and we're not going to look exactly like we looked like before the pandemic hit. Which are the next wave of companies that are poised to succeed in a post-pandemic world? It is often said that we inadvertently pressed the fast forward button on living in virtual space. There was a massive migration from physical to virtual. Some of it will be reversed, but most of it will not. And us living in virtual space, we, we don't have as yet the infrastructure that allows us to live well in virtual space. For example, who would have thought Zoom would be what Zoom has become? But even Zoom now is, is starting to face pressure. So we're going to see a whole host of new industries evolve. That's one issue. The second one is going to be data management. We are producing so much data in virtual space that it's not going to be something where we're going to leave the big platforms to have this data. More and more small companies are going to come in and give choices to the providers of data as to how, what they want to do with their data. So look at it, look at everything that's associated with virtual space, both how you serve the virtual operations, but also what do you do with the product of people participating more virtually. What do you think is the fate of these big city headquarters in places like New York and LA? The big city headquarters will remain. In numbers, they'll be somewhat reduced, but I don't think that, that much, but they'll be much smaller. People will think much more of satellites, much more of hub and spoke models than they have in the past. This notion that you concentrate everybody in one place, the mothership, and you have everybody there as, as much as you can, I think is gonna change quite a bit. So we will still have these headquarters, but they'll be much smaller in size and in dominance. What are the implications for taxes of a remote workforce? Like, What does that mean for cities, uh, social services? So first states have to sort out how they want to deal with this. It's fascinating to see states fight over tax income, and I understand why they're doing it. So, you know, we've got to have some sort of uniform approach right now as to how do you account for residency when the workforce goes more hybrid? And I don't know what the answer is, other than this is something that needs to be sorted out. Um, Social services, again, they're going to evolve. They're going to go, they're going to be provided to where, where people migrate to. Which cities do you think will be ghost towns in five years from now? So I don't think cities will be ghost towns. I remember when everybody said that's the end of New York. And I said, no way. What you will get is a lot more hybrid. What the pandemic does is it adds an extra layer of urban challenges to existing urban challenges. Whichever city you look at, if you look at New York, San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago, they had issues, which now they're gonna have to deal with much more. So it's gonna be yet another set of challenges for, for city officials to deal with. Where do you think salaries go from here? If people are no longer required to be in cities like New York or San Francisco and they can work remotely, are we going to see uh, you know, average median salaries go down? So it depends who you are. We're already seeing labor shortages, right? We're already seeing skill mismatches. When you change the world and you change the workplace, skills don't adapt accordingly. So what, what, what we're going to see is much more bifurcation, much more bimodal. And that's something that coming out of the pandemic, we have to realize. What's the greatest challenge that the pandemic and ensuing recession exposed? I think inequality. I think, you know, we we all started thinking that we were equally exposed to COVID. 
We're all in this together. We'll all get out of this together. No one is safe until everybody is safe. You've heard these phrases. But it didn't take long to realize that that's not true. Some people were able to protect themselves and their families much better. Some people were able to work from home and not miss a beat. Others had their livelihood destroyed or alternatively had to take massive risk in conducting their everyday life. Think of, of the people who help us in grocery stores. The risk they were exposed to. So we've sort of recognized that this pandemic well, isn't equal at all. I call it the great unequalizer. And that is something that surprised actually a lot of people. And we have to do a lot of very serious thinking, including companies. Companies also have a responsibility for their, for their communities. Every distribution that I look at, social, economic, political, institutional, that used to look very well behaved, the normal distribution, the bell shape, what we have found is the belly of the curve has come down and the tails have gone up. That is what inequality is about, but there's a different issue. These bimodal distributions are much less stable than the normal distribution. And that's why it's really important to talk about these issues early on, because we don't want to introduce an extra element of structural instability to our world. How would our economy fundamentally change if a significant number of employees decided to continue working remotely for the next several years or even indefinitely? A good part of our economy serves the labor force, be it commuting, be it restaurants, be it takeouts, they all serve the labor force. So that's going to have to evolve. The good news is that part of the economy is quite flexible. So I expect it to evolve quite rapidly once we have clear evidence on what's going to emerge. The harder part to evolve is going to be office real estate. That is going to take more time because we have too much capacity for what's ahead of us right now. Employers are legally allowed to fire employees who refuse to get the COVID vaccine, but do you think that any will actually go through with it? And I'm hoping that it's not going to be a major issue. I'm hoping that people would realize that if you calmly assess the costs and the benefits, the benefits are so much higher than the costs. But this is going, to be, it's going to be difficult and there's going to be enormous peer pressure on the people who are not vaccinated. So look for that to evolve. There will be tensions like there are tensions right now on other things. But I don't think it will get to a stage where they're going to fire. But remember, other industries, transport in particular, international travel in particular, are going to move towards this notion of a vaccine passport. And what we may find is that the catalyst comes from outside the workplace. People want to travel for holidays, etc. And, and that may be the driver to a much higher rate of vaccination than would occur otherwise. Broad question, but what is the future of healthcare in this country? I mean, if this pandemic has shown us anything, is that tail risks exist, that when they hit the health sector, they are particularly damaging, and that our healthcare providers are not appreciated enough. So what you'd like the future of our healthcare system to look like is one that adjusts for these factors, that allows us to have better healthcare overall for everybody, not just for a select few, and that appreciates and pays our healthcare workers what they deserve. That's what it should be. So if that is a destination in a mile, I think we'll take the first half mile. And unfortunately, there's a great risk we're gonna get distracted after that. What is the future of schooling and childcare? And do you think we're going to see further disruption in the space? So on schooling, going into the pandemic, we had an innovation that we never really used. And that's called the upside down classroom. You lecture by video and you use the school time, the physical time to solve problems. And we discovered during the pandemic that our kids actually are quite good consuming lessons by video, but where they really need help is in solving problems. That's where they need the attention. That's where all the homeschooling has gone, right? You can't just stick your kid in front of a, 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 a computer and say, listen to your class or listen to the lecture if you're at university, because there are all sorts of questions that arise. So my hope is that the school system, the university system will learn that you can deliver a lot of content on video and you can free up the time of the lecturers, of the teachers to deal more with one-on-one. -on -one. That's my great hope. Childcare, we've identified major, major 
gaps in our childcare provision system. And we've seen how that impacts the labor force, how that impacts women, how that is disastrous. It's a calamity for single parents. And I think that we have to pay a lot more attention. I call it part of infrastructure. And I know that people disagree with me, but I think of, of infrastructures enabling physical activity, human activity, and technological activity. And if you want to enable more people to work and work well, you've got to provide support on childcare. We've seen women fall out of the workforce at a much higher rate because of the childcare crisis. Do you see that trend persisting uh, you know, post-pandemic and should the government be stepping in to do something about it? So I certainly worry about it, that we have gone backwards on female labor participation, we've gone backwards on poverty reduction, we've gone backwards on a number of very important objectives for everybody. I hope that if the governments and companies support society on childcare, that this is temporary and reversible. It should be. This is not hard to solve. This is not an engineering problem. This is a resource problem. And it's a perfect place for private-public partnerships. Are we going to have a stronger economy in 2021 than we did before the pandemic hit, or are there going to be lasting implications? So both. We're going to have a very strong economy in 2021. We're going to recoup quite a bit, if not all, of what we lost. And we certainly, by the middle of 2022, we will be back in aggregate, I want to stress, in aggregate, where we were before the pandemic. That's the good news. But we're going to have a number of legacies. Inequality has worsened. And not just the inequality of income and wealth, but also the inequality of opportunity. That has hit particularly hard certain segments of the workforce. Women got hit much harder than men. Minorities got hit much harder than the majority. Those with less education got hit much harder than those who have a college degree or beyond. So we're also going to emerge much more unequal. And that is problematic. Third, we're going to have long COVID effects. And these long COVID effects are going to come not just from those people who are unfortunate enough to get COVID, but others who are isolated for a long time. I think companies are going to discover that human resilience, the reservoir of human resilience has been really run down. And they're also going to discover that social capital, the networks, the fabric that's so important to the workplace has also been eroded. And that's two things that every company is going to have to work on. We haven't gotten to the stage yet where we look at the silver linings from this pandemic. We're still very much, for understandable reason, looking at all the costs, all the unintended consequences, the negative unintended consequences. But there's a lot of silver lining. We can work smarter and we can evolve into smarter workplaces. So while there will be a few segments hit particularly hard, it's not going to be as bad as people thought in the beginning.